Let us pray. Father, we ask that you would speak to us through your word. Open our hearts and minds to a greater understanding of your word today. Let those hearing hear the words that you would say to them, and that you would be glorified through your living word. Amen. 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 So as we read, we're looking at Colossians 2 today. And in my previous sermon here, I looked at Colossians 1. So let us start with a quick recap of what is in that, given that we are continuing with Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul reminds the Colossians that Christ is the Lord of creation and that all things were and are created by him. That he was the firstborn of all creation. Christ is above and superior over all these things, for all have been created by, through and for him. Christ is God, he is eternal. The church in Colossia knew these things and so shouldn't have been misled from the truth that had already been given to them. But let us not be too critical, <clears throat> for we all have the potential to be deceived at times. So let us remember to always be on our guard and to test the word being taught to us from the front. <coughs> Excuse me. We also saw in Paul's letter the greatest and most important pointer to the doctrine of Christ known as Christology. And these we read in, the, in Colossians 1 verses 15 to 20. So that's a brief recap of the last time. So starting with Colossians 2. Regulations are everywhere in life. We can't avoid them. Most are for our good, some not so, and some we wonder what or why they are even there. But we don't always do as we're told, don't we? We'll see a sign on a door saying wet paint don't touch. But what's the first thing we want to do? We want to touch it just to make sure. The other day, I watched a short video on a website called Postcode Lottery. You register your postcode on this site and it gives you a chance to win a cash prize. It's not a big cash prize. Sometimes it can be up to a hundred pounds though. But it doesn't cost anything to register and it doesn't cost anything to play. It's all free. So as a 10 year celebration of this, the chief executive of the website went out into his hometown and wanted to give a £10 note to people just to promote his business. And he wasn't asking for anything, he was just willing to give a £10 note to people who were willing to accept it. Nobody wanted to accept it. Nobody wanted a £10 note except for one person. Some were even cowering behind their friends. They thought something suspicious was going on. And people, we are suspicious, naturally. Maybe rightly or wrongly so. But nobody asked him why he was giving out a free £10 note. Nobody asked the question. And it's the same with the word that we hear from preachers. We are taught the word from the front. But we need to question what are we being taught and we need to test it against the scripture because that is the benchmark. All this will make sense as we look through today's passage of Colossians 2 and we ask ourselves the question, is Christ enough? Because this is what Paul is basically trying to tell the Colossians and the Laodiceans. False teaching was filtering through the churches in these areas and Paul wanted to highlight and warn of these things. And as you look through Colossians 2, it is split into different parts. In the first bit, there's a reliance on human or worldly based philosophy from verse 1 to 10. Jewish legalism from verses 11 to 17. Mysticism, including Gnosticism, from verses 18 to 19, and ascetic living, 
20 to 23. It was misleading and dangerous, the teaching of false doctrine. As Christ, we cannot afford, as Christians, sorry, we cannot afford to compromise on the word and the works of Jesus with either philosophy or legalism. Both of these are man-centered and created, whereas Christian, Christianity is Christ-centered. There's a clue in the name, Christianity. As we already know, or at least should know, that Christ is enough. We all have, he gives us all that we need, and often a lot more. We do not need to invoke other spiritual powers or intermediaries. Christ is significantly and infinitely greater than anything else. Christ is the one we must hold on to and we must depend on him and not on ourselves or others, especially so-called intermediaries. As, we re as I covered earlier from the recap, I said Christ is above and superior over all things for he created, he, he alone created all things. All things were created by him, through him and for him. So that is what we must focus on. We are reminded at the start of Colossians 2 that the letter was both for the Colossians and the Laodicean church. In verse 1 Paul tells us how great a struggle I have for you, referring to both churches. Although Paul had never met them face to face, he had been working hard on them in prayer. He was earnestly praying for these new believers that they should not fall away from Christ. And this is a good lesson for each of us to remember when we meet new Christians or bring a new believer into the church, that their faith can and sometimes does fall away. So we should lift them up in prayer to strengthen them, to give them that focus and courage. And it's the same for us too. We can sometimes fall away. So pray for yourselves and for each other that you would be strengthened in Christ and not be, be led away. We should be praying for protection and earnestly praying for strength for each other. Remember, Ephesians 6 tells us of the armour of God. So it's good to refer to that when praying, to ask for the armour of God to be placed over us, to protect us from the evil one. Paul is also praying that these new Christians would be encouraged, have unity through love, so that they may know God's mystery. What is God's mystery? It tells us in verse 2, it says, God's mystery, which is Christ. This seems a strange way for Paul to refer to Christ as God's mystery. The word was probably used because this was a word often used by the Gnostics, in that they wanted to portray that there was something more than just Christ, that there was a mystery that only they could reveal as truth. Even the Jews sometimes also used mysticism and wanted to declare that they knew more because they referred to what we call the Old Testament. They would have known of God's mystery, his secrets declared by the prophets and visions of old. But all these prophecies and visions all point to Christ. The whole Bible points to Christ. Paul, however, wants to clarify to his readers that the mystery of God is found where? In Christ. And so he goes on to say in verse 3, This has now been revealed in Christ to all, to each and every one of us, the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wow, what an amazing gift. We get to know the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge because we know Christ. Paul emphasises that Christ is the ultimate source of divine wisdom and spiritual knowledge. 
Let me ask you a question. Do you wish you'd won the lottery or do you sometimes still wish you could win the lottery? I sometimes do. And it's just a human thing that we sometimes we want more than what we have. Money in and of itself is not evil. It's what's behind that motive of wanting the money and what we intend to do with the money. That is what can be evil. Michael Carroll, otherwise known as the King of Chavs, a name he gave himself, he won the lottery uh, 10, 12, 15 years ago, I can't quite remember. He won 9.7 million on the National Lottery. Despite his initial claims that he was going to invest the money and not squander his winnings, he did just that though. Blowing his money on drugs, women, fast cars and as all chaps must have, chunky jewellery. The level of car Carol's spending was so great that within a decade he was broke. He didn't have a penny. The wild parties had taken their toll, not just on Carol, but on his neighbours too. They were even provided with an emergency hotline to report his antisocial behaviour. And although he'd been savvy to set up an investment bond, exorbitant, exorbitant withdrawal fees meant that by 2010 he pretty much lost every penny. He now spends his time working in a biscuit factory. There are many other cases like him. He's not the only one to have lost every penny that they won on the lottery. When they win it, they believe they have it all, that they've made it in life, that they've secured their future. But have they? Obviously not in this case and the case of many others. But I say to you now, and I also say this to myself, Christ is enough. Paul warns the believers not to be deluded by plausible arguments. He warns the Colossians and the Laodiceans about the direct and dangerous threat in their midst. It is even important, even for us today, that we should know the threat of false teaching around us, especially within the church, because their arguments can be reasonable or sound reasonable and can be persuasive. But do they match what's in the word, what's in scripture? That is what we need to test. Matthew 7 tells us, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And also the Apostle John also warns us in 1 John 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Paul is not suggesting that the believers have yet fallen to the prey of the false teachers, but, but this is a warning to them and to us to be ready. The apostle knows from experience that the work of the Lord is often followed by attacks from the enemy. The attack is cleverly possible, but uh, as a clever plausibility of teaching, near enough to the truth to be apparently respectable, but so far away that it is devastating in its effect on both the individual and the church. We know that we that we know that they haven't yet be, been deceived, because Paul says in verse five, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Thus, 
all is well at the moment. So Paul, Paul rejoices with them. In the next two verses, he also continues his positive message. He reminds them to walk in the Lord, just as they did when they first heard the gospel from Epaphras. And we all know what that's like. When we first hear the gospel, we are so filled with the Spirit that we want to tell the world around us what the message of Christ is. But as time goes on, it starts <coughs> to diminish. But we need to renew and re-engage with that energy that we once had. Paul tells the Colossians that they need to be rooted in faith. He's using an agricultural metaphor here to help the understanding of the, and the importance of it. It's a symbolic way and use of, of, the, of the word. And if we think out to ourselves, uh, consider ourselves a great big oak tree be fir being firmly rooted in the soil. A great oak tree, once firmly established, is almost impossible to be uprooted or moved as its roots go very, very deep into the ground. And our faith should be like a great oak tree. It should be firmly established. Not like tumbleweeds that have no roots and are blown this way and that way by the winds in different directions. And you can probably see that picture in your head from an old western movie on TV with a tumbleweed being blown down on a deserted dirt road being blown this way and that way by the wind. And then you get that silence <coughs> just, <coughs> me, just before the gunfight. Which gives us an, another analogy, another picture of where we are. For we are in battle. Every day we battle the enemy and the dark forces, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, which says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Nor are we to be transplanted from one pot to another, from one type of soil to another. For when we are firmly rooted in the faith given us by Christ, there is no need to change soil or pot. The roots of a tree or a plant draw up the nourishment so that the tree can grow. Unlike gardeners who add, who add feed and supplements, to plant some trees to help them grow. We get all that nourishment from Christ to feed our roots. So as I can say, Christ is enough. Going back to the picture of a mighty oak tree, we know that the roots also give the tree strength and stability. And our roots as Christians should be the same. We should get our strength and stability for life from Christ. This is not to say that we will not face any storms, we will not face any turbulence. But as a mighty oak survives the winds and the, the battering storms, so we too will survive all that the enemy throws at us if we establish our fir roots firmly in Christ. He, Paul goes on to say, I'm using the analogy of an, an architectural building being built up. We all know that for a building to survive, it must have good, solid foundations. And the same applies to Christians. We must, and I can't emphasize this enough, we must read our Bibles and pray daily, or regularly at least, to be built up based on the foundation of faith in Christ. Now I know there will be times when we'll struggle to read our Bibles and we'll struggle to pray. We all go through the droughts, even I do. We all go through these droughts. But let's not punish ourselves for being in these places. Let's take today as a new opportunity to start afresh reading our Bibles, praying. And if you're not already doing so, please start today because it is that which refreshes our soul. It is that which establishes us firmly in the foundation 
of Christ. And as Warren Weasby, a prominent commentary writer, puts it, Satan has a difficult time deceiving Bible-taught believers. Paul finishes the sentence in verses 6 and 7 with abounding in thanksgiving. And we all have a lot to be grateful for to God and to Christ. For Christ is enough. I know that many of you are going through struggles of various kinds at the moment. But remember that the Lord is in control. He orders all things. So let us focus at the moment both in trials and joys on the Lord. He is always rich in his blessings. So let us take a minute to silently give thanks in our prayers to the Lord for all he has given and done for us. And I will say Amen. From verse 8, Paul is placing our focus directly on Christ. So let us look at the pointers to Christ in the verses 8 to 15. Verse 8 says, according to Christ. Verse 9, for in him, that is Christ. Verse 10, filled in him, and it also says, who is the head. Verse 11 says, in him. Verse 12, buried with him and raised with him through faith. Verse 13, made alive together with him. Verse 14, this he, that is Christ, set aside. And verse 15, he, Christ, disarmed and by triumphing over them in him, in Christ. Now let us go to back to verse 8. Paul is now getting to the heart of what is known as the Colossian heresy. Paul isn't dismissing all philosophical ideas or deep thinking here. He is dismissing and rebuking all philosophical ideas that is explicitly anti-Christian. The false teachers in Colossia pose a real and damaging threat to this new church. False teachers still do to this day. Paul says, see to it that no, no one takes you captive. This is not a literal taking captive, like a hostage, but Paul is referring to taking someone as captive who is ignorant of the truth and of the word of scripture. And so is taken captive and it all is fashioned by philosophy and the empty delusions of the false teachers. As stated earlier, not all philosophies are wrong. There is some philosophies which are Christian focused, are Christ Christian based. For the word philosophy simply means to love the wisdom. So all I'm asking you is be discerning. Be discerning with what you hear and what you read. Paul's warning was and is therefore concerned at those who do not know the doctrines of the Christian faith and can be easily captured by false religions. You need to remember that the doctrines of the false teachers were and still are rooted and have their source or tradition in or from man or people. And it is not the tradition or wisdom of God as we Christians believe. The thing to remember about any teaching of philosophy, practice, mindfulness, meditation, etc. is where does its origins come from? Where does its roots come from? Where does its source come from? Things like yoga, mindfulness, which seems to be mentioned a lot these days, witchcraft even, and especially white witches, are not only common these days, they're actually encouraged these days. And I recently read an article in Christianity Today magazine that yoga is now okay for Christians because there is a Christian yoga. No. 
There is not a Christian yoga, and there never will be a Christian yoga. Yoga has its roots predominantly in Hinduism, and even with some Buddhism now in it too. There is no Christian root to yoga. Let me make that very clear. Wiesby adds, and I quote, If a new Christian from a distant mission field were to visit many of our churches, he would probably be astounded at the ideas and practices we have that cannot be supported by God's word. Our man-made traditions are usually more important to us than the God-given doctrines of the scripture. While it is not wrong to have church traditions that remind us of our godly heritage, we must be careful not to make these traditions equal to the word of God. End of quote. That's a good reminder for each and every one of us to check and to test what we do in our churches. What is the source? What is the reason behind why we do these things? Now let us jump on to verses 9 and 10, which says, For in him whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Before I look at this, let us look at this story from J.E. Yoda. Sorry, I have no idea who he is, but it's an interesting story he gives us. He says, <coughs> author Peter Kreef tells the story of a poor, <coughs> poor European family who saved for years to buy, buy tickets to go to America. Once at sea, they carefully rationed the cheese and bread they had brought for the journey. After three days, the boy complained to his father, I hate cheese sandwiches. If I don't eat anything else before we get to America, I'm going to die. Giving the boy his last nickel, the father told him to go to the ship's galley and buy an ice cream cone for himself. When the boy returned a long time later with a smile, white smile on his face, his worried dad, Dad asked him, where have you been? In the galley, eating three ice creams and a steak. All that for a nickel? Oh no, the food is free, the boy replied. It comes with the ticket. The Apostle Paul warned his readers about false doctrines, false teachers, who were offering them bread and cheese instead of steak. They were in the danger of forgetting Christ's sufficiency and relying on their own self-effort. We who have tr trusted Christ for salvation have been assured not only of the safe passage to heaven, but also of everything we need to live for him here and now. Looking again at verses 9 and 10, we are reminded of that not Jesus is not only man, but he's also God. He's fully human, he's fully God, fully deity. And as we sang in our first hymn, In Christ alone my hope is found, we are reminded in the last but one line that Christ is my comforter, my all in all. Again I say to you, Christ is enough. Not only do we have the absolute deity of Christ revealed in this verse, but his perfect humanity as well. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. This is also the fulfilment of the previous verses. For if you have Christ, you don't need mystery. You don't need secret knowledge. All you need is Christ, for he gives it all. Paul in the following verses addresses the issue of Jewish legalism, specifically circumcision. Here he is making it very clear that the legal ritual of the Jews to have circumcision is not required by Christians uh, to please God, as Christ has already performed this for all believers. By Christ willingly submitting himself as both man and God to the crucifixion, suffering death on the cross, and there then being raised from the dead, our guilt, our shame, and most importantly, our sin have been paid. 
the debt of these have been cancelled by Christ on our behalf. We don't need intermediaries, we don't need angels, we don't need mystics to be our mediators. We don't need these things like the Gnostics or the Jews, or to go through any rituals like the Jews. No, the slate has been wiped clean before the Father because of his grace and because what Jesus has done for us. Thanks to Christ, who was the perfect and unblemished Lamb. Now, as we look at the final section, verses 16 to 23, which is the last section of this chapter, this looks at the ascetic living and human rules or human religion. As Paul reminds the churches, he also reminds us that we do not need festivals, we do not need astrologers, nor do we need to question what food or drink we may consume, unless you all obviously have allergies. We do not need asceticism, that is, one who carries out severe self-discipline and avoids all forms of indulgence. We definitely do not need angels or mediators between us and Christ, for Christ is our mediator to the Father. And we especially, above all things, don't need or want false teachers veering us away from the truth of Christ's salvation. Don't look to other humans for your wisdom, but seek it from the one who is wisdom, Jesus Christ. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight, Proverbs 9.10 tells us. And Paul finishes this section with a warning to all of us in verse 23. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. They have no value, is the primary warning in that verse. That's been a lot to take on board today, I know. So let me sum, simply sum it up like this. Is Christ enough? Yes, 